Hi, and welcome to The Curling Show, the podcast that brings you interviews with the sports top athletes and the people who shape the game. Brought to you by Fit to Curl, a sports-specific guide to training for the world's greatest game by a guy who's heading to Vancouver very soon, Canadian Olympian John Morris, with some help from me, Dean Gemmel. You can purchase the book at fittocurl.com, at many pro shops, and in select bookstores, including Audrey's in Edmonton. Whether you're a junior player, a developing curler, an elite player, or a senior, you'll find a program in Fit to Curl that will help you feel better on the ice, make a few more shots, and sweep more effectively. A world champion in 1993 with Russ Howard, the skip of the Ontario rink at the 2000 Briar, and the runner-up in that province the last two years, Peter Corner, welcome to The Curling Show. Yeah, thanks, Dean. I really appreciate you giving me the call and looking forward to it. All right. Hey, over these last few seasons, curling fans outside of Ontario might wonder what you've been doing a little bit. Uh, Your team plays on the Ontario Curling Tour, but it's a limited schedule, uh, and you don't really travel outside the province. Uh, But on the the OCT this year, you're 17-3, and and the only spiel that you entered this year and didn't win was the Sun Life Classic, and that's an event that was won by Mike McEwen of Manitoba. You also went undefeated through your Ontario zones and regional play. How good do you guys feel about how you're playing? <laughs> well, I hate to laugh about it, but uh, I really don't know why the success this year. I can't put our finger on it. We've played a little bit more. We decided to dedicate a little bit more time to curling. Obviously, la- lost the provincial final last year to Glenn and his guys. and We just felt that we ran out of gas late in the week at the provincials, and we thought we better play a couple more spiels this year to get ourselves more prepared. and. You know, it's just uh, things have just clicked, but we, we really haven't played that much. I don't think any of us are throwing that many rocks. It just seems that we get out there and things are clicking and we're making shots and getting breaks and taking advantage of it. You know, it's no secret, Pete, that you've always been a guy who can get, you know, maybe as annoyed as anyone when you or your team isn't playing to the standards you expect. That said, as playing less, you know, maybe with different expectations, has it made the game a bit more enjoyable? Uh, it has. It has. You know, those, those days, uh, hey, look, I still want to win. I'm still as competitive as ever. I've just my priorities have changed in my life. And, um, you know, i got a great family and spend a lot of time with them. And I have a good job and, and uh, pretty dedicated here as well. But uh, I still want to win, and I can still be angry Pete on the ice at times. But uh, oh, don't, yeah, yeah, don't get rid of angry Pete entirely, Pete. I mean, no, that's, that's why I win some games. So, uh it, make, it makes for a good time. But, no, we, we certainly, uh, the, the, the three of us are all on the same page, and I think that's what's made this team pretty successful. We're, our families come first. We decide to play a limited schedule, and we've, we've just really enjoyed ourselves this year. We, we get to go home every night and sleep in our own beds and no traveling, and, and that's probably why we've been successful this year. Hey, the Ontario Men's Tankard is on February, starts on February 1st in Napanee, Ontario. Uh, with Glenn's team coming off the trials disappointment, you guys may be feeling a little better about your game this year. Uh, but I, I'm guessing the sense maybe among all the teams in the tanker this year is that this might be the year that, that, that Glenn's team is, is most vulnerable in the last few. Uh, is that sort of the case? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, Glenn and his guys, they play an awful lot of curling, and, and they play at a high level. It seems like every bond spiel, they're down to the last couple of teams. So... Uh, I would think not winning the Olympic trials, they're probably pretty eager to get to get to the briar and, and uh, even go one step beyond that. So I think once they get there, they're going to get the juices flowing and, and they're going to be awfully tough to beat. But, you know, they've won the province the last uh, four years in a row and sooner or later that uh, run has to come to an end and maybe it'll be this year. Yeah, you know, it, you talk about them in, the, in the, their first briar win actually came in another trials year as well, though, didn't it? 2006. Uh, yeah, I guess it did. You yeah. know, and they, you know these guys have dedicated themselves to curling the last uh, bunch of years, and and it shows. You know, they are awfully good. You look at some of their line scores as far as the stats go, and they're all up in the ninety percent. It seems all the time. So, I think that's a message sent to the rest of us that if we're going to give them a go at the provincials, we better pick up our game and play awfully well to beat them. What do you think of the rest of the field of the provincials? Uh, you know, sort of. Some of the veterans, like Brian Cochran, some newcomers. Uh, who else in there is, is tough? Yeah, I think the field is, 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 
you know, other than Glenn, it's pretty, the rest of the 10 teams that are there are pretty equal. You know, Rob Lobel, I think this is his, his third year back to the Provincials, and they're a good team. He's a veteran. He doesn't get rattled by anybody. Kirk Zaiola's back. Um, he's always been a giant killer, and he'll be tough to beat. Joe Franz, Mark Bice. Uh, yeah, Brian Cochran's been to the Briar before, so it's it's a good mix. It's going to be a, a good test for all of us, and the key is being consistent throughout the week and winning more games than you lose and hopefully getting to the playoffs. Now, you guys actually would have had a bye to this if uh, Glenn had won at the trials. Was it actually maybe with the amount you're playing, though, it might have even been an advantage to have to go through zones and regionals? Oh, exactly. We, you know, I think we finished our last spiel in the first week of November, or maybe mid-November, and so if Glenn had won the trials, we would have been off for an awfully long time before we played. We've, at this point now, going into the provincials next week, we'll have a, a month uh, of no curling. Uh, I saw Ted a couple times. But other than that, I, I haven't even talked to Graham on the phone. So it would have been an awfully long break between events. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's going through the, the playdowns in Ontario is tough, and it's a bit of a grind, and it's, uh, I think we're ready. I think we're ready for next week. Where did you guys play your zones and your regionals? We played our our zones in Acton, Ontario, and we played our regions in Shelburne. Wow! A couple of small little communities, but uh, both uh, both both rinks had great ice, uh, and uh, and uh, we played well, at, you know, in both events. And as you mentioned, we got through undefeated, so um, no complaints. Let's for a moment talk about a guy who won't be at the uh, Ontario Provincials. Your cousin Wayne Mada, uh, a guy you curled with, uh, you know, uh, all. A lot. Let's 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 say from junior to men's, whatever. You guys had all kinds of junior success together. You had those great years uh, playing front end for Russ and Glenn, uh, and then Wayne left to skip his own team uh, when you stayed with the Howards. Uh, then in '05, you and Wayne started playing together again, and it looked at first uh, when you guys won a Grand Slam right off the bat in Port Hawkesbury that the magic was back. But uh, it was barely a season and a half later, and you weren't in the lineup anymore. Uh, why did it go south, and uh, were you disappointed in the way things worked out? Well, you know, the first year we played together, it, we really did click. Everybody played well. I remember that year, and we, uh, you know, we we just played well as a team. And again, we we got every we got the the most out of all of us. You know, Scott and Phil and myself and Wayne. It just seemed like everything was coming together. It was our first year at the provincials, uh, and we lost out to Glenn. Um, and then we rededicated ourselves again for the next year and made a change to get Ian Tetley on the team and. And nothing against Ian, that, that team just didn't click. And, you know, I personally didn't play all that well that year. And um, uh, I just felt that maybe the vice position wasn't for me. Um, and you play an awful lot of takeouts, and I just I don't hit like I used to, and I felt that I didn't have my A game. But midway through the year, I pretty much knew, um, you know, things weren't going well for us and fought hard to try and fix it, but it just wasn't just wasn't working out. And I kind of had a feeling towards the end of the year that it probably wasn't in our best interest to move forward. And Wayne and I had a talk and decided to, to part ways. Uh, any hard feelings at all, or was it just it was just that easy? It was it was really that easy. I I think I opened the door for Wayne and said, "Look, at I just really don't feel like playing as much as you guys want to play, and I certainly uh, have a bit of a bad knee, and so playing that much." You know, it, it really started to show, and I and I knew I wasn't playing at the level that I wanted to play at, and it was time to bow out. And I made it easy for Wayne, and uh, you know, we all went on our merry way, and and uh, and uh, things have taken shape since then. You talked about the difference of the vice position. How different do you think vice is uh, today than say from the uh, mid '90s? Well, I, I, it's it's hard to say. You know, the vice the vice has to be the best curler on the team, no doubt. You look across the board and. And between uh, Johnny Moe and and uh, Johnny Mead and and most of the vices out there and Graham, you know, from back in the, in the late '90s, early 2000s, uh, Graham was unbelievable. And uh, the difference is, is he's the, the the vice is the middleman, and he has to certainly listen to the skip, and he has to listen to the front end, and then make decisions in between there to keep everybody happy. So years ago, the skip called the game, and everybody else didn't say a, w- a word, and. And uh, but now the vice is kind of that mediator on the rink, and and uh, he has to have those skills. And on our team, Graham does it. You know, he, Ian loves to get involved in in strategy, and we have Graham to to deal with them, and it it works out really well with us. That's a good way to put it. Dealing with Ian on strategy. Well, you don't really. There isn't. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that you can't really deal with any, Ian on anything. So, uh, 
But, uh, no, to be honest, on our team, um, hey, Ian's won three Briars and three Worlds, so when he speaks, I listen. We don't always do what he suggests, but uh, I certainly give, a, give him his moment in the sun and and because uh, he's been there and done it, and he's got a lot of great strategy and, and some good advice to offer. Well, it's interesting on the vice position. I, I think it, you know, the, well, the skip has the challenge of context, a greater context for the shots where you make it, you lose the yeah. game, or you make it, you win the game, you miss it, you lose. Uh, the vice often has to make more exacting shots. There's often less room for error. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, if the front end doesn't play well, the vice can certainly pick things up for you and, and can still somehow manufacture a three or set up a three for the skip to finish off. Um, and he can also set up, you know, big ends as well. And, and Graham on our team has been a master of that all of his life, and he's still doing it for me, and it's just uh, – uh, it's great to have a vice that can come out and shoot 90, 95%. But again, you look you look at Glenn Howard for for Russ all those years. He was a guy that just was that consistent, you know, never curled below 80, 80, 85, and gave you that 100% game every now and again. And and that's what the vice has to do to to uh, to be a part of a successful team. Yeah, that's what you know. Glenn has that with Richie now. So um, yeah, absolutely, that's absolutely true. In 2000, you skipped an unheralded team with Todd Brandwood, Drew Macklin, and Dwayne Piper that beat Wayne when his rink was Graham, Ian, and Scott Bailey. Uh, how do you rank that win? Ten years ago now, I can't believe that, but how do you rank that win when it comes to career highlights? Well, it's certainly right up there. You know, the funny thing about that team was is I had curled the whole season at second for Russ Howard and Glad and, and Neil Harrison, so I hadn't even skipped that year, and and I had never curled with Todd Brandwood or Dwayne Piper before. I curled with Drew and Juniors. But um, when Russ moved to New Brunswick, uh, these guys asked me if I would skip their basically a club team in the playdowns. And, and it, was my, it was my best option because Russ had moved on. And I decided to do that. And we got going through the, the, the zones and the regionals. And at the provincials, we everybody just started making an awful lot of curling shots. And, and looking back now, it really was... Uh, kind of a Cinderella story you know we got to the Briar we went eight and three and and lost to Jeff Stoughton but you know that's probably one of my regrets in curling is the day we walked off the ice at the Briar in 2000 I've never curled with that team ever again and uh, it's just funny how it all worked out you know what, what's interesting is I think a lot of people forget that you're eight and three you know they uh, you know there's not many surprise winners uh, you know, over the last Gosh, 20 years in Ontario almost. You throw, you know, there's you, there's Bob Ingram, and uh, that might be it. Um, yeah. And, and you guys were 8-3 and three at that, Brian, and really wound up in a nightmarish tiebreaker scenario. Yeah, exactly. We were 8-3, and we were eight and three, and I handed a win to Russ, and I handed a win to Quebec. And uh, both two games that I felt I should have won both of them. So, you know, we could have been 10-1 and one very easily. And then we... You know, Jeff and his team were the defending, I think, Briar and World Champions that year, and we had to play them in a tiebreaker. It was a messy tiebreaker, and, and he got us. But, uh, you know, Drew and, and, and uh, my whole team that year played awfully, awfully well for me. And, and like I said, they just kept making curling shots. But looking back, they allowed me to skip the team, and I think that's why it worked. We had so much success. Is they let me skip the team, and everybody played their positions and uh, it was. It was a magical, magical, you know, two-month run for us. Hey, what about the early to mid-90s, the big years with Russ, Glenn, Wayne, and you? Uh, people remember the Briar win and the World Championship in 93, but you also played in four straight Briars and were runners-up in 1992 and 1994. Uh, what's the final score if EA Sports creates a curling game and your current team plays against that team? My current team, uh, ooh, um... I don't think we're going to have a winning record. Um, you know, <laughs> that team was awfully good. And, uh, you know, I look back at, I think it was 1993, where we, the year that we won, we won the Provincials playing the Three Rock Rule. We won the Briar playing the old peeling, you know, style of curling and the conventional rule. And then we went on to win the World at, at the Four Rock Rule. So uh, that team was pretty strong, and we, we could play all sorts of different styles of games and, and I really don't think, uh, you know, my current team would have a winning record. We might be able to beat them a couple times, but out of 10, uh, two would be a, a pretty good score for us. Yeah, I'd have to put that team in my top three, I think, all the time. I think, uh, I think the thing I always liked about the team was you guys all threw the rocks so similar. Um, yeah, we did. We, you know, we, we, we just loved curling, you know, back then. And it was, uh, 
once we got rolling and realized how good we were and we started traveling a little bit more, um, we lived and breathed curling for those four or five years, and we won an awful lot of curling games. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. You know, looking back now, like Russ and Glenn and I and Wayne, we'll, we'll go golfing, we'll reminisce about those good old days, and, boy, we just sit and laugh and laugh. We just had so much fun, and that's looking back, that's what it's all about. Hey, finally, you were always a guy, uh, even as as a junior, I remember, uh, who was known for throwing a ton of rocks. Uh, you got a you got a sore knee now, and everything else, and you're and you got a family, and and you're like a lot of us now. You're in your forties, so I don't think that happens as much anymore. I'm sure you practice. We spoke briefly about that, but uh, when you do practice now, how is it different than it was, say, fifteen or twenty years ago? Yeah, you know, last when, years ago in the early '90s, uh, when I was playing a lot with Ross, I did. I threw every day or every other day, and it would be forty, fifty, sixty rocks a day, and. I was just, I felt like I was a machine back then. And now I think over the years of throwing so many rocks and curling so many bond spiels, I, I do. I struggle with a bit of a knee. It's probably 85, 90% at best. And so I feel now I just have to go out and I try and just get my sliding lines down and get my draw weight down. I'll throw eight to 10 rocks up and I'll do it back and, and I'm done. And I'll do it a couple times before an event and away we go. But uh, those days of throwing every day, before between events just uh are are behind me i just can't do it anymore but as long as i get out and i get my sliding lines down i feel pretty confident and and uh this year especially i haven't thrown very many many, many, excuse me very many rocks at all and i've probably played one of my best years ever so hopefully i can keep that going all right pete we finished with a run back i give you a topic you give me your thoughts in one to three words you bet uh being i think the only guy to play all four positions at the ontario tankard Damn, I'm good. <laughs> I think you are. I don't think anybody else has played all four. Yeah, I've had a lot of that, some of that circumstance, but uh, yeah, that's I'm I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, the durability of the AMJ Campbell Van Lines commercial that features Russ Howard and you, I believe, with Ken McDermott sweeping. Actually, that's Neil Harrison. Is it and Neil? In that? It, yeah. Oh, I thought it was it. Ken McDermott. I thought we were. It was a really strange little clip. Oh, it's Neil. No, that's Neil, and I'm the one hopping down on the left side, and it's, it's you know, my uh, my stardom there is so short. I, I point it out to my daughter every once in a while, but the clip goes by so fast, she can't even see me. She, she doesn't even recognize that kind of television it's on either. <laughs> that's right. Uh, curling in the hometown of Avril Lavigne. Uh, what am I, who's doing that, me? You right are, now? Napanee, yeah. Oh, wow. Napanee. There you go. Um, maybe I can meet her. There you go. The best pure thrower you've ever seen. Boy, Ed Wernick. No, that's not true. I'll have to say uh, it's got to be a tie between Russ and Glenn. I was going to say Ed Wernick for best pure thrower. I mean, this <laughs> next one might be Ed Wernick, the smartest curler you've played. Yeah, it's hands down Ed Wernick. If I could call a game like him, I'd have a, a few more Purple Hearts. You know, I sat with Ed for, for two ends, I think, in Mississauga at that Capital One World Cup of curling. And, uh, I mean, in two ends, I learned uh, you know more than I've learned in 20 years in the game just chatting with Ed. So. Yeah, it is. It's you know you watch the skins games and you watch the way guys call the skins games now, and they all learn that from from Eddie. So um, yeah, he was ahead of his time, I guess, or ahead of the rest of us. But uh, yeah, he's definitely the best strategist ever. Losing to Jim Sullivan in the final of the 1987 Canadian Junior Men's Championship it was definitely heartbreaking. But you know, yeah. Wayne has said on the show that it was the best thing that ever happened to him. Well, maybe Wayne, but I certainly didn't enjoy it. I was watching that Ontario Junior game the other day and uh, on Sunday, and I felt for that Ontario team. It looked like maybe late in the game they weren't going to win that, and it brought back some pretty bad memories for me losing to, to Jim and the boys uh, out in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. So, um, no, I don't look at it as a positive at all. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what do you think, uh, what do you think of the uh, coaching uh, moves in that game for Ontario? Well... Um, I didn't uh, think it was, I think it interfered with the game, and I think some of the, the strategy calls that he suggested were wrong. And uh, they were very lucky to get away with that with that win. I felt that uh, some of the suggestions that he made were, they got away with it, put it that way, and, you know, no, no offense to um, to the coach, but, uh, yeah. Well, that, that one call led to a, it was a gimme three. I mean, it was, uh, and the kid didn't want to throw it either. Absolutely. Yeah, it w- would have been. Russ called it that way, too. He said, yeah. if he makes it like this, it's a gimme three, and sure enough, he does it. And 
And I think it's John Thompson is the coach, and no offense to him, but uh, he's lucky it's junior curling. Uh, you, you, did you guys have a coach? When Did you guys have a coach with you at, at, in 87? Well, we did. We had Drew Macklin was our uh, our unofficial coach, and uh, Wes Gordon from Brampton was our coach along with um, oh, a CCA member now, and Fred, oh, geez, I can't remember his last name. I apologize. Um, but we did. We had an official coach that year. You know, I'd almost like to see the uh, coaches and junior not allowed to come out during timeouts, or you know, I think the, oh, I think the kids learn more. I agree. It, it, it is. It's a dis- it really disrupts the flow of the game, and I feel in the women's curling they do it a lot as well, and I, it just it disrupts the flow of the game. Um, plus, back then in 1987, you know, Wayne didn't listen to a coach anyway, so it really didn't matter. They were just there with front row seats. But uh, yeah, you know, I don't think they need them out there. You have to learn somehow. Well, there's talk of the WCF of eliminating timeouts altogether, so uh, I guess that would take care of that. But um... well, anything to speed up speed up the game. Uh, eight ends is fantastic. We eliminate some of the timeouts and the coaching calls. You've got to speed up the game. It's getting so boring to watch. It's such a long time to sit in front of the television. But you and Wayne are both uh, guys who play like you've got a flight to catch. So, uh... Well, I, I try to, but when you have Ian Tetley on the team, it, it does, he's, you know, now again, nothing against Ian. It, when you start talking strategy and with the four rock, three rock, all the change in the rules, and there's so many different options, it slows the game down. And Again, we, we get into so many discussions out there that uh, it just takes so long, and then you run tight for time. But if I had my way, yeah, we'd be playing a lot faster. Ian, the human rain delay. <laughs> well, you know, Ted, again, he's a, Ted's a great guy. He's still, he has so much passion for the sport. He loves to curl, and I love having him on my team. I'm looking forward to, uh, to playing with him again next week. All right, I better get back to the run back. The last one, beating Scott McPherson in 1985 in the finals of the TCA Junior Spiel back when it was called the Sun Life. Now, that's the best thing that ever happened to me in curling. <laughs> you know, I was one sheet over <laughs> watching that, and it was if it was the best thing that ever happened to you, it was definitely the worst thing that ever happened to Scott McPherson. Absolutely. When you uh, whiff a couple of wide open takeouts to go to Switzerland at uh, 18 years old, that is definitely the worst thing that'll happen in your career. That, that probably that that's a bigger that's a bigger loss than losing the Briar final. You know, it was it really was unbelievable. And poor Scott, I'm sure he struggled with that one for a long time. But we sure enjoyed our trip to Switzerland. We had a hell of a time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he ever recovered. Actually, I don't know. But didn't Stu go? Was Stu Garner playing with him then? And I'm trying to remember. You know what? They were older, right? They were a little older than you guys and, and and my team. And I remember on the next sheet. I remember we let his last one go, and there was just this this horrible groan. I mean, from the, it was horrible. Well, the funny thing was about all that is is he was hitting a rock that looked like it was off the rings, and he tried to hit and roll into the circles for the win. There were he could have drawn to the 12 foot for the victory right. and the rock was off the rings by half an inch and he decided to hit and roll on and he actually whiffed it and we measured it and it was on and we went to switzerland i thought he actually didn't he even tickle it a bit just to no it was a clean miss right out of his hand we were pretty happy about halfway down but uh i don't know if Stu garner was on that team or not if he was i'll bring it up this uh, next week when i'm at the provincial there you go there. playing lead for rob labelle yeah all right, Pete, I enjoyed it. Uh, I give everybody a chance to name their sponsors with your limited schedule. Have you guys had anybody this year? We, uh, we don't have a sponsor. We are uh, self-sponsored. And, uh, again, you know, when you curl a limited schedule, we just didn't want to put the time in out there chasing sponsors. But, hey, if anybody wants to jump on board for a week at the Provincials and some Kojiko time, um, give you've me got, a call. You've got uh, space on your unis available. We have space available, absolutely. All right, Pete, I appreciate it. Good luck uh, in Napanee at the, at, the, at the Ontario Tankard. Thanks, Dean. I appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. That's Peter Corner on The Curling Show. If you don't have one already, pick up a copy of Fit to Curl by John Morris at fittocurl.com or your favorite pro shop. Thanks for listening. Here's Black Pudding. <laughs>